Good, uh, good morning, everybody. I hope today is finding you well. Uh, we are uh, in John chapter 12. We're about halfway through the, the gospel of John. It's taken us a while to get there, but I hope you can appreciate and understand um, just how much scripture really uh, uh, means and, and, and why we shouldn't just simply just breeze over it. Uh, God speaks through every word of scripture. There's little details we don't quite understand or, or get, but uh, as it spoke to those whom it was written to, it still speaks to us today if we're patient enough to sit down and listen. And what's more, by his Holy Spirit, the whole of Scripture reads and, and breathes and gives new life every single time we read it. it. It gives us different understanding every time we read it because the Word of God is living and active, sharper than a double-edged sword. And it is, is something that, that is beneficial to the lives of everyone who says they are called by Jesus' name. So when I'm reading these things to you, and I, I know we don't get through uh, a, a lot of scriptures because we do this once a week. I hope you can see, and I hope you can understand, and I hope you know that God is trying to reach you. And I pray this over you too, is that you just don't take my word for it. That you are in the Word of God every single day. Jesus himself would get up to go and spend time alone with his Father. He would pray. He would study. He would read. Most of what Jesus said or did was through the, the Old Testament scriptures. His apostles were the same way. The, the, the prophets were the same way. They knew the scriptures. If you look, and, and I mean, there's a beautiful diagram. Uh, and I'll, I'll post a picture of it sometime later. But there's a beautiful diagram that st that shows the, the correlation between each chapter and verse of the Bible. The Bible does not contradict itself. It's not full of, of contradictions. It's only full of contradictions to people who've never actually sat down and taken the time to study it. So I want you to know that <clears throat> while I do this study, and the only reason I do it only once a week, is because I desire that you would be in the Word every single day. More so than this, don't depend upon a preacher. Depend upon the Word of God and the Holy Spirit. Jesus will speak to you, even if you don't feel like you'll understand. It just takes time. It takes effort. It takes energy. That being said, let's go ahead and dive into the Word. We're in Luke, or John chapter 12, verse 1. You might recall at this point, this was after Jesus had raised Lazarus from the dead. So um, afterwards, he's spending time with Lazarus and, and the family of Lazarus, Mary, and Martha, his sisters. So six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus was, the one that Jesus raised from the dead. So here he is, alive. Everyone knew he was in the ground, buried for four days. Jesus called him out. So they gave a dinner for him there. Martha was serving them. As this seems to be her habit. And Lazarus was one of those reclining at the table with him. Then Mary took a pound of fragrant oil. This was expensive. Pure and expensive nard. And anointed Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the oil. Why would Mary do this? In the book of Isaiah... Isaiah writes, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. And just like every other scripture, it all points to Christ. And so using this pound of expensive oil, she was anointing him as the messenger who brings good news. Why? She had a lot to be grateful for, right? Right? Her brother, who had been dead, had been restored completely to life, was sitting at the table with them. She was elevating him and anointing him as her Lord as well, kissing and washing his feet and wiping it with her hair. Just as the prostitute who had done so during that dinner with the, the Pharisees, where she washed Jesus' feet with her tears, His message was good news. 
And so she elevated and anointed him beyond any other rabbi or teacher. This, she was saying, was her Lord, the one she would follow to her death. But listen to the response of this. Then one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was about to betray him, said, Why wasn't this fragrant oil sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? How often do we deny a work being done in our presence? And let's look at the reason here. We should have sold this and given it to the poor. Now, we're going to get into Judas' real reason in just a minute. But we see a work being done. We see a blessing being given. And especially today in our, our technology-driven, centered society, we see so many people. We see so many people giving their opinions on everything. Giving their opinions on uh, how things should be done, why they should be done. And really what we're doing is we're seeing the hearts of people. They're not really interested in helping the poor. They're interested in helping themselves, either to look better, to give an opinion, to bolster their position, to look better in the eyes of everyone around them. And that's what's going on. Because listen to this. He didn't say this, verse 6, because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. He was in charge of the money bag and would steal part of what was put in it. See, he was an opportunist. Judas Iscariot, even though he did miracles, even though he was one of the 12 sent out and one of the 72 sent out, he performed miracles, he cast out demons, he preached the gospel, he performed works that, that, that some of us would only dream of doing by the power of the Holy Spirit. And yet he was an opportunist in the midst of the church getting ready to betray Jesus. We've got to ask ourselves what, how we approach Jesus. Now there's a third uh, example given here. And we'll get to that in a minute. But Mary approached Jesus humbly, worshipfully, anointing him and anointing his feet with something that was at least a year's wages. The most expensive thing she could do, she gave all she had. Judas, on the other hand, was jealous and desired only to get what he wanted out of it. Which one of these are you today? How are you approaching Jesus today? Are you giving all you have? Or are you seeking what you can gain? I'm going to tell you, only one of those is acceptable and pure worship before God. One of those is a living sacrifice. One of those is self-worship. We've got to be careful how we approach Christ. It goes on. Jesus answered, leave her alone. She's kept it for the day of my burial. For you always will have the poor with you, but you do not always have me. Jesus under understood that he was not merely being prepared for burial, but being prepared for glorification. Because only through his death that he was glorified. In his full and complete and utter obedience to God, he fulfilled his plan and purpose on this earth. And thus he was raised and elevated and glorified to the right hand of the Father. Philippians 2 has much to say on this. Let's take a look. You've heard me quote it before, but I think it's, it's worth repeating. Philippians 2, verse 5. Make your own attitude that of Christ Jesus, who, existing in the form of God, did not consider equality with God as something to be used for his own advantage. Instead, he emptied himself by assuming the form of a slave, taking on the likeness of men. And when he had come as a man in his external form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death even death on a cross for this reason and here is where i'm talking about for this reason god highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name so that at the name of jesus 
Every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. This is why he was anointed. The perfect sacrifice became our King of kings and Lord of lords by his obedience and selfless sacrifice for our sake. He gave his life as the ransom for many. This is why he is worthy of praise and honor. Yet still, when Christ moves, people seek to also dethrone him. They seek to erase his works. Let's take a look at this. A large crowd of Jews learned that he was there. They came not only because of Jesus, but also to see Lazarus, the one he had raised from the dead. They all knew he was dead. Therefore, the chief priests decided to kill Lazarus also, because he was the reason many of the Jews were deserting them and believing in Jesus. You see, the Pharisees and the priests were just like Judas. They were opportunists. You notice earlier in the Gospel of John, when John the Baptist's disciples come to John and say, they're baptizing more than you. What did John say? John said, he must increase and I must decrease. Here, they're jealous of the works that Jesus are doing. Jesus is doing things they cannot do. And so rather than try to appeal to God, as Jesus did, they appealed to their own selfishness and sought to erase what Jesus did by murdering somebody. How often, when God does a work among us, do we try to ex explain it away because it's something that happens out of our worldview or our purview? Believer, it's time to let go and trust God. It's time to anoint him. It's time to give all we have for him. Because otherwise, he'll tell us, I never knew you. He'll tell people who went to church their whole life, I never knew you. He'll tell people who did amazing things for God. I mean, he says, not everyone who says to me on that day, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. And some will say, didn't we prophesy and perform miracles and cast out demons in your name? In our more uh, sensible, and I say that loosely, day and age, people say, well, Lord, didn't I go to church all the time. Lord, didn't I do all these things all the time? God, I was there. I gave up everything. No. Jesus will look at them and say, I never knew you. Away from me, you doers of lawlessness. Why? Because they did not do it for him. They did it for themselves. And it's because his name is powerful that they were able to do it at all. They might have done it in his name, but they did it for themselves, which is why Jesus never knew them. So believers, how are you approaching Jesus? Are you humbly worshiping him at his feet? Are you anointing his feet? Or are you seeking your own opportunity? This is something that's not just preached to you, it's preached to me. We all have to search our own hearts on this so that we can become like the one who formed us and made us. I love you. I'm praying for you. Hope you have a great day. Let me know what you think. Tell us in a comment, a counter video. However, I would love to hear what you think. God bless. We'll see you soon.